Hello again everyone, this is chapter 6.4 where we'll be discussing graphs of sine and cosine functions. Now I wanted to start off by recalling some sine values. In fact, we're going to do all of sine values at the special um, angles anyways in one full rotation of the unit circle. So notice I don't write 2 pi here because 2 pi is equivalent to 0 on the unit circle, they're coterminal that is. And in the first quadrant, we found that trick, if you recall, sine of 0 is 0, this is 1 half, this is radical 2 over 2, this is radical 3 over 2, this would be radical 4 over 2, which is 2 over 2, which is 1. And then how do we find the others beyond that? Well, if you kind of follow the unit circle here, the first quadrant is given by the trick, basically, for the first five. After that, we kind of go backwards. And really, remember what I said. Well, all we need really is the sign according to the All Students Take Calculus uh, acronym, depending on what quadrant we're in, and the reference angle, which if you're in radians is super easy to find, just cover the numerator. So here, the reference angle is pi over three. Two pi over three is clearly in the second quadrant. So it's going to be positive because all students is S, sign means it's positive in that quadrant. So this is gonna be sine of pi over three, which is radical three over two. Similarly, this will be sine of pi over four. It's also positive. In fact, up to, I guess, this point here is where we'll now be beyond the second quadrant, a sine of pi. So sine of pi over four is radical two over two. Sine of pi over six is one half. And they're in the first quadrant, so they're, so they're positive, good. Sine of pi, well remember, sine is also another way of seeing it, is the y value of the point. So here the y value is zero, here the y value is one, here the y value is zero. So this is zero. Good. In fact, the nice thing to think of is that any multiple of pi, any integer multiple of pi, so sine of zero times pi, one times pi, two times pi, three times pi, even negative one, two, three, and four times pi will all be zero. Because they'll either refer back to this or this angle, depending. Now, sine of pi over 7 pi over 6, well, 7 pi over 6 is in the third quadrant. In fact, all of these here are in the third quadrant. Sine is negative in the third quadrant, so covering the numerators, we'll see that we really just get a repeat of the ones next door. Sine of pi over 6, pi over 4, and pi over 3. And I guess uh, pi over 2 is actually not in the, um, in the third quadrant. But anyways, we'll get these but negative. So we'll get negative 1 half, negative radical 2 over 2, negative radical 3 over 2, and that's it. Now, sine of pi over 3 pi over 2, sine of 3 pi over 2 is over here. Its y value is negative 1, so this is negative 1 naturally. These three values here are these ones, and those are in the fourth quadrant. All students take calculus, that's a C. Cosine is only positive there, sine is not, unfortunately. So it's just going to be negative those values. If we cover the numerators, again, we get sine of pi over 3, which is radical 3 over 2. Pi over 4 would be radical 2 over 2. And sine of pi over 6 would be 1 half. So it's negative 1 half. Perfect. So now we have these values. And what we're trying to do now is we want to graph the function. So let's take a look at the graph of the function f of x is equal to sine of x, where x is our input and sine of x is the y value, our output. So let's see if we can figure out what the graph will look like. And it's not too surprising of a result, but let's see if we can figure it out. So the first thing I want to um, do is kind of scale this accordingly. So I'm going to scale it like this. So each of these sections here will actually represent quadrants and we'll go beyond. So this will be, let me write it a little below. So this will represent the first quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant, and fourth quadrant respectively. Just like that. Uh, it didn't quite come out, but let me lower it a little bit so we can see. So I just labeled the quadrants. Anyways, um, where the... Where the first quadrant is separated is between 0 and pi over 2. The second quadrant is in between pi over 2 and pi. The third quadrant is in between pi and 3 pi over 2. And then uh, the last quadrant here will be in between 3 pi over 2 and 0, but since we're increasing, 
zero is coterminal to pi, uh, two times pi. Good. Now remember that in the first and second quadrant, sine is positive. And in fact, if we plot these numbers, I don't know if I'm going to do it justice if I plot them one by one, but I'll try. So let's see. So zero will correspond to zero, zero, zero. Pi over six, well, we'll have to kind of dive into this a little bit. So here I'm marking the halfway point, which is pi over four. Sine of pi over four is radical two over two, which we've approximated previously as 0.707. So that's kind of like a little close to one up there. And pi over six, which I kind of passed, will represent a y value of one half. And that'll be about here, let's say. And the sine of pi over two is then one. And of course I'm kind of surpassing radical three over two. Radical three over two, as it turns out, is about 0.866. It's a lot closer to one than 0.707 is. So it's kind of hard to do, th do this justice on the board like this, but if you try plotting them yourself, you'll kind of see what I mean. You have to approximate where things are because they're in decimal. Well, they're weird decimal numbers, I should say. But anyways, going backwards, you actually get the same values in reverse. So you'll basically just get this image here. Back to this. And if you connect these, connect the dots here, you end up getting this hump here. Now, even though this looks like a circular shape, it is technically not circular, which people often get confused by. But for right now, we don't really care about what the shape looks like or specifically if it's circular or not. Just know that it's round like this. Now, as it turns out, in the third and fourth quadrants, sine is negative of those same values so I'm not going to plot them, but you can plot them and verify that you'll get this shape also, but down below. Where this hump here corresponds to the y value of negative one, of course. So what we end up with, with is this wave shape, and this is known as, coincidentally enough, well, not coincidentally enough, a sine wave. So if you've heard the phrase sine wave before, this shape comes to mind when you think of um, maybe like audio or electricity or whatever the case may be. These are practical applications of sine and cosine. And uh, we'll get into how tangent behaves a little later in 6.5. But in any event, that's what we have here. Also, we can actually go beyond just one full rotation. Because if you go beyond one rotation to two rotations, let's say, or even backwards to negative rotations, well, you still land on these same points in the unit circle. And remember the sine doesn't care wh um, what the angle is as long as it lands at the same point. Meaning, let me just show you in red, that this image actually repeats to the left and to the right. So it repeats like this and like this. Uh, by the way, this here is kind of like the, uh, the one true waveform we care about that's repeated infinitely many times to the right and to the left. And this is known as, well, I guess its length is known as one period. So here, this is one period of sine, and the actual period is the length of the, well, the length of the, the actual values in which it takes place. In other words, two pi minus zero. So the length of the period here is two pi. So this I'm just going to call period. This is one period. So two periods of sine would be it repeated twice. So the first period of sine is right here. It's like the main waveform we care about. And now we'll take a look at cosine. Right, so now we're gonna consider cosine, but before we consider cosine, let's recall this identity we saw for, well, it was co-function identities. And we see that cosine is the literal co-function of sine meaning that we've, we take sine of 90 degrees, which by the way is pi over two in radians, minus theta, then we'll get cosine of theta actually. So we're gonna take advantage of that and of transformations that we recall from algebra one of uh, functions and then see if we can apply them to find the, well, the graph of cosine based on the graph of sine that we already have developed. So we're gonna graph f of x equals cosine of x, but using that identity, cosine of x is just sine of x well, not sine of x, but sine of pi over 2 minus x. And here, this is y is equal to sine of x. This is just one period shown, but we know the deal. It just kind of copies and pastes um, throughout. 
And for cosine, well, again, it's pi over two minus x on the inside. So what this means, if you recall from transformation from algebra one, well, the negative in front of x means it is actually flipped across the y-axis. So if we flip this image across the y-axis, just to show you, you'll get this instead. And since we're adding pi over 2, we're actually shifting this image to the left by, um, by pi over 2. So let's see, to shift it to the left by pi over 2, well, this is pi and half of that is pi over two. So now this line here will become our y-axis. So really the shape that we'll get actually will look something like this. In one period. So here this is two pi and this is pi. So we have intercepts at pi over two and three pi over two on the x-axis. Which make a whole lot of sense if you recall of course that Cosine of pi over 2 is indeed 0. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is also indeed 0. And again, much like with sine, if you copy and paste this throughout, and I'll just show you in a different color here, you indeed get the full image, which is really just another sine wave. In fact, this particular one is called the cosine wave, of course. And really, the rest of this section is just looking at other transformations of sine and cosine. The real funny thing though, is that since cosine is already just a transformation of sine, any transformation of sine and cosine will just go back to a transformation of sine. There are certain applications we'll be possibly taking a look at, but we'll take a look at some particular examples right now and then we'll see where it goes. Actually, this is basically the last idea in this section to be quite honest, but I'll do a few examples after this one. Uh, but here we say the graphs of y equals a sine of bx minus c and y equals a times cosine of bx minus c have the following characteristics. So these are the more general um, transformations of sine and cosine. So we call the amplitude the absolute value of a. So whatever number is in front, multiplied in front of sine or cosine, ignoring the sine, that number is called the amplitude. Now what the amplitude really represents is the furthest it can go away from zero, um, x, uh, x axis, y equals zero that is, in the positive or negative direction. So usually what we have, for sine anyways, well sine or cosine in fact, the amplitude is one because the furthest it deviates from the x-axis is just one. But notice that from transformations from algebra one, if you multiply a function on the outside by a number, it stretches it vertically by that amount. So in this case, it'll actually stretch it um, twofold basically. So if there was a two in front and this amplitude was two, well then this one would be a two now. So this, this image would be stretched to two vertically. All right, and uh, what this b multiplying by b on the inside to x does is it actually shrinks instead of stretching, it shrinks horizontally. Um, well, the graph, the entire graph that is, and since the period is two pi because that's the length of one cycle as we saw previously, well, multiplying by b on the inside of of the the function for sine and cosine in front of x, what that does is it actually shrinks the period by a factor of b, so the period will now be two pi over b. And we want to assume that b is bigger than zero. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. And uh, there are two notes I see here. So the first one says left and right endpoints of one cycle interval is determined by solving these equations. So notice bx minus c is just the inside of sine and cosine. So usually the inside starts at zero and ends at two pi. So we're saying that if the inside is 0 or 2 pi, these represent the ends, or beginning and end, of one cycle for each one. And that makes a lot of sense. Now notice for the first one, though, if you actually solve this, we can outright solve this, and we just get x is equal to c over b. Of course, adding c and dividing by b. And this is actually known as the phase shift. So it's important that I give you that language here. And the phase shift is essentially just how much it's shifted around, either to the right or to the left. And this will actually tell us where it's shifted to, and we'll see that with this example, actually. The next note that I put here is that uh, b being greater than zero can actually be forced using some identities that we actually could have seen in 6.3, but I just didn't have time to show you them. And there are these, they're so-called even and odd identities. So 
sine is what is called an odd function, where cosine is what is called an even function. Now, odd just means that if its argument is negative, the negative can be pulled out. But even means if the argument is negative, then the negative goes away. Think of uh, even and odd powers. For example, if you have, uh, I don't know, x to the third or negative x to the third. Well, negative x to the third, let me just show you. Negative x to the third is the same as negative x to the third, which makes a lot of sense because you have three copies of negative x. Since you have an odd amount of negatives multiply, the result is negative. However, if the power is even, like let's say four, then the negative just goes away because, well, two copies of a negative in multiplication is positive, and since four is even, you'll have two pairs. So that's kind of why we borrowed those names for functions in general. And this is a topic that was also discussed in Algebra 1 when uh, talking about graphs of functions. Anyways, moving on to this example now. So here we see a graph. Uh, we can tell what the amplitude is. We can tell right away what the main graph looks like and try to apply transformations. And we're just asked to graph this. So let's see if we can uh, get onto it. So what I want to do is I want to consider y is equal to sine of x. And I'm going to basically draw it and see what transformations we have to do to it first. So there's our normal graph for sine of x, for one cycle anyways. And one cycle is good enough because we know that sine just multiplies in each direction indefinitely. Same thing for cosine. But we just need one period, so one cycle period. The amplitude is 1, negative 1. The period is 2 pi. This, of course, is half of that period. Perfect. Seems okay. If there was a negative in front, you would just flip it. So instead of going up and then down, it would go down, then up. That's fine. Now, if you multiply this by 1 half, the amplitude shrinks because, of course, the amplitude is, um, is 1 half. So let me just write that here. The amplitude, absolute value of A is just 1 half. The phase shift is, it seems to be pi over 3. So you can actually solve for x when you set the inside equal to 0. And let me just show you that setting this equal to 0 gives you x is equal to pi over 3. And this is our phase shift. Let me just write ps for pay, phase shift. Okay. And this is, uh, by the way, this is our amplitude. Our period I'm not going to write here because the number in front of x is 1. Since the number in front of x is 1, the period is still 2 pi. So we're not shrinking the cycle, actually. We're just uh, shrinking it vertically like this and shifting it uh, by pi over 3. And in fact, it's shifted pi over 3 to the right. So solving the inside being equal to 0 will give you where it starts. So it's going to start at pi over 3. So now, the highest it can go is 1 half. The lowest it will go is negative 1 half. That's the amplitude. Instead of starting at 0, now it starts at pi over 3. Okay, adding a distance of pi to that because again, the, the period doesn't change. Well, I guess we could just add two pi to get to the end. Um, so let's, let's do that. So let me write over here, two pi plus pi over three. Uh, by the way, this is the same as solving the equation, the inside equals two pi. So notice if x minus pi over three is equal to two pi, adding pi over three to the other side will give you x is equal to this. And of course, we can write this as 2 over 1. 2 over 1 is 6 over 3 to get a common denominator. So let me just write that. And then adding these gives us 7 pi over 3. Perfect. So 7 pi over 3 is going to be, let's say, over here. And their midpoint, which I was trying to get at earlier, well, I guess you can just eyeball it and label it later. In fact, I guess we don't really have to label it if we don't want to, but I want to label it. Um, it's just the midpoint of these. So really what you can do is just add these and take their average. So if you add pi over 3 to 7 pi over 3, you get 8 pi over 3. And if you divide that by 2, it divides the numerator by 2, so you, so you should actually get 4 pi over 3 now. And there we go. That's one cycle, and I'm going to extend this cycle um, in a different color. So like this. So this is just one example of a transformation of sine and cosine. And there are, of course, applications to this. And I said we'll do a few more examples, so let's take a look at those right now. Right, so now finally for these two examples here. First off, I'm asking to find the graph of this uh, transformation of cosine, which is, I think, fair because we just did one for sine. 
This one's a little different, of course. I want to recall these period identities, which I've been talking about, but I actually haven't written down like this. So the periods for sine and cosine are 2 pi, meaning that if you add any multiple, any integer multiple, so here k represents an integer, either positive or negative, so positive or negative whole numbers basically, even zero, I guess, to the inside angle theta, then it'll just be the same as sine and cosine of theta anyways. So here, 4 pi, that's 2 times 2 pi. So with that being said, we can really just basically ignore this because of the period identity. Um, yeah, so, so this is really just equal to cosine of 2 pi x. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But then um, for tangent, tangent's period is actually pi, believe it or not. And I'll, I'll let you investigate that on your own, but it's not too hard to justify this. So if you add any multiple of pi to the angle theta inside of tangent, that's just going to give you tangent of that angle alone. All right, so now let's get into this problem here. And, uh, well, let's discuss these uh, items that we just spoke about previously. Let's find the amplitude, let's find the period, and then let's find any phase shift, PS. So the amplitude is the absolute value of the number in front, which is negative 3. So the amplitude is just going to be equal to, well, 3. Period is, remember, it's 2 pi divided by the number in front of x. So the period here is going to be, well, 2 pi divided by the number in front of x is actually 2 pi. So dividing 2 by, by 2 pi gives us a period of 1. That's going to be interesting looking, but we'll kind of see what that looks like. Now, phase shift, hmm, there actually is no phase shift as it turns out, because since um, adding 4 pi is just shifting that cycle uh, basically four, two periods over, is one way to think of it, um, it actually doesn't really affect anything because the one that would be, the cycle that would be two periods before would now be in place where we were looking at previously. That's kind of what these do for us. So phase shift, there's actually none. In other words, we start at zero and still end at, well, not two pi now, but we're going to end at uh, one because that's what the, uh, the period is. So now let's see if we can look at what the graph looks like here. So let's try to create a xy plane. I think this is okay. Now the highest is going to go is three, so I'll label this as three. Let me kind of make some borders here. There we go. The lowest is going to go is negative three, because again, that's the amplitude. So I want these to look like they're the same length. That's a little better. And you expect to write from zero to two pi, but here the phase, the period is actually one. So we'll actually see one wave of cosine. Remember how cosine looks. It starts below and then uh, goes up and comes back down. So let's see, it'll look something like, and I need to, halfway will be up here and then it'll end down here. So it's gonna look something like this. I'm trying to get it just right. There we go, that looks okay. So that's more or less what one cycle of this uh, cosine function will look like. Oh, also, it's negative, I almost missed that, good. The fact that it's negative means it's actually flipped vertically. So let's do that here. So this point moves down here, this point moves up here, and vice versa. Perfect. Doesn't look too bad. So now let me erase what I had there in, uh, in black. There's a fine eraser for that. And that's actually kind of nice way you can uh, you can see what it is. So if you have a negative in front, it wouldn't be a bad idea to actually do what I did, even though I kind of almost made a mistake there. It wouldn't be a bad idea to write it normal first and then flip it vertically. Good. So there we go. That's one uh, cycle, and that's really it. From here, we can actually add um, other cycles to repeat. So it can go on and on like this. And then we start to see the sine, well, so a sine or cosine wave is known as, in general, known as a sinusoidal wave. So we see in general what the sinusoidal wave looks like. So I'm just copying this blue one cycle repeatedly to the right and to the left in red, and we kind of see what it will look like in general. So there we go, good. So we've done the first example, great. Now for the next example, it oh, looks like a lot of words, but let's just read, it's actually not too bad. So here it says for a person exercising, the velocity v in liters per second of airflow during a respiratory 
say respiratory cycle. A respiratory cycle, by the way, is the start, the time of the start of one breath to the start of the next breath. So the time you take in between breaths, basically, is given by this equation here. So the nice thing is that they actually give us the function. We don't have to build a model. Uh, sometimes in math, that's generally the hardest part of application problems, you have to build a model. But um, yeah, so that's something that may be asked of you, depending on what class you're taking. But for the class I'm teaching here for this, I, we won't be asking those kinds of things. Just wanted to give one example of, uh, of showing the application of these, these things. Anyways, uh, here V is equal to 1.75 sine of pi t over 2, where t is time in seconds, and velocity being positive means there's an inhalation, velocity being negative means there's an exhalation. Now, the really great news about this is that we can see the amplitude is 1.75 and it's positive. So it's going to look just like sine. We don't have to do any vertical flipping. The also good thing is that this here, though it looks kind of funny, really is just the same as pi over 2 times t. Because multiplying by 2 and dividing by, uh, multiplying by pi and dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by pi over 2. Notice there's no addition or subtraction in the inside of sine, meaning there's actually no phase shift. So this will actually be pretty easy to graph, I, I'd say, and that's the last thing we're being asked here. So now let's read the rest. So A says, find the time of one respiratory cycle. So it kind of sounds like they're asking us to just find the length of a period because a period here will, will represent a cycle, of course, and in this case, it's a respiratory cycle because that's what this models. So that makes a lot of sense. And we can just, uh, well, we know how to find periods, so let's just do that. Let's find the period here. Let me do it in a different color just so we can distinguish between our answer and the question. So the period is equal to what? It's equal to, well, it's going to be 2 pi divided by the multiple of our variable. In this case, our variable is t. Usually we're used to x or theta, but they gave us t here for time. And we're going to solve for time. So let's see. So the period is um, pi over 2. So again, period is 2 pi over the number in front of x. So it's going to be... Let me just write it out. It's 2 pi divided by the number in front of x. The number in front of x is pi over 2. And when you're dividing a number by a fraction, you could just multiply the top by the reciprocal of the bottom. So you'll just get 2 pi over 1 times 2 over pi. That's a nice way of seeing it. And what will happen here is the pi's will cancel, and the 2's multiplied to 4, so we get a total of 4. Now, Remember, t is measured in seconds. So this right here represents the length of the interval of one cycle on the t-axis, because here the variable is t, not x, meaning this will be actually seconds. So one, four seconds will uh, give us one respiratory cycle. The next question asks us to find the number of cycles per minute. Now, at first, it sounds like a very bizarre question, but it's really just trying to standardize what this is saying. Here, what does this say? Let me write it over here, and again, I'll use a different color. This actually tells us from part A, so let me just say part A implies that we have one cycle, so let me write one cycle like that, every four seconds. What we want to find is how many cycles do we have for every minute? So what do I multiply four seconds by to get one minute? Well, if you recall that there's some conversion to do here, if you recall that uh, 60 seconds is one minute, you would have to multiply this by what to get 60? Well, four times 15 is 60. So if you multiply this by 15 and this by 15, because of course you can just treat this as a fraction really, what you'll end up getting is 15 cycles for every 60 seconds, but instead of seconds, I'm gonna write a minute. So one cycle for every four seconds is the same as saying there's 15 cycles every minute. And now finally, we'll ask, we're being asked to find the sketch of the graph. Um, I don't really have too much space, but you know what? I'll do it actually over here. That's not too bad, I don't think. So now notice our amplitude is 1.75. There's no negative, so we don't have to flip. We just draw a sine wave, basically. And our period is, there's no phase shift, so we start at zero like normal. Good. Our uh, period is 4, so we go out to the number 4. 
Instead of going to 2 pi, we go to 4 now. So it's kind of more standardized. Kind of like this was standardized to 1. Half of 4 is 2, so halfway between 0 and 4 will be 2. And then we can just do our sine wave business. So like that, and like that. There we go. So that's a sketch of the graph. Of course, it's to this scale. So it's not to like the normal scale. I mean, if you uh, had graphing paper and you wanted to scale it, you could, and it's not too bad actually. But if you want to compare to how this is scaled compared to um, the original sine function before applying any transformations, you could certainly do that. But I'm just kind of showing it here with the numbers given. That way it's easier on us. And then of course, if you want to, well, that was kind of bad, but that's fine. If you want to extend it, you can definitely extend it is what I'm trying to say. So we just want to graph one cycle and then from there, the rest is just copying and pasting. So that's it for 6.4. I really hope we enjoyed this section. It's just uh, the graphs of sine and cosine in certain applications. Really, it's just understanding that transformations can be applied to sine and cosine as well as any other function. And that's really it. So I'll see you in the next video for 6.5. Thanks for watching. See you then.